I know it's a tough gig to do this in the afternoon, um, uh, just after a, uh, an afternoon tea break. But um, when, when David asked me and, and Nick asked to contribute to this conference, I said, this audience, they're all experts around workforce and the future of work. What, what should I talk about? And I thought this session here today is really more about a reminder and a contextualizing. What are some of the things that are going on in the new world of work that are really important? And how does technology play into that? As David mentioned, I'm from Germany. I'm used to those conferences be being rather formal. So I'm um, getting to know the much more relaxed and informal style here in Australia, and I really enjoy that. So if you have any questions as I go through the presentation, please raise your hand or please shout, scream. <laughs> I'm very happy to make that as interactive as possible. So um, just for the session today, I'll briefly bring back a few data points. We heard so much about data so far, but just a few that contextualize what, when we talk about the new world of work. And then I zoom into three of those trends that are particularly relevant as you all disrupt yourself and disrupt your organizations. Um, and I bring a life example at the back end of that presentation around that as well. Now, it's interesting. The data that I use, there are two data sources. It's our own annual survey that we call the Global and Australian Talent Trend Report, where we capture the insights from executives, from HR leaders, and from employees. We want to really understand all perspectives on what they see as the key challenges and opportunities when it comes to the, the world of work. And the second piece is the work that we do with the World Economic Forum uh, around the future of jobs and skills. And it's really interesting. Trust in companies is at an all-time high. Employees trust their organization much more than they trust the government, and it's particularly relevant in Australia. And that the research has been done before the election, one has to say. So. Um, 82% of organizations say they, they trust their organizations to do the best for society. They also trust that their organization did the best they could to navigate the pandemic, which is enormous. At the same time, energy levels in organizations are at an all-time low. And that's, that's a, really important, uh, a, a really important dilemma. Just as the pandemic started, 72% of employees told us that they feel energized about the work and about the challenges. Now, that has dropped to just about 50%. Um, and that's a significant, it's the biggest drop in energy in organizations since the inception of our, of our research. So that is significant. The second one is, we talked a lot about data. There is an absolute uh, you know, we are bombarded with data. We, in fact, we are processing five times more data than, than we did 25 years ago. And um, in fact, we are processing as much data in a day, 34 gigabytes, than our 15th century ancestors. Maybe Leonardo da Vinci processed a little bit more. I saw that picture. But if you were born in the 15th century, what you did in a lifetime is what we do in a day. That is significant. So that, with that comes a huge amount of cognitive overload and challenges. It's interesting, we also asked, we always ask employees, what is your view on AI and automation and how might that impact your work? 70% of employees told us, and this is a significant increase over the last two years, that they believe that AI and automation will fundamentally change their job in the next three years. Very good news for you and the, and the startup, knowing that this is part of your mission to truly do that for the professional and legal services industry. Now, I'd like to go into three <coughs> trends that, that are really shaping what's going on. One is obviously technology, how that is reached. Re redesi redefining how work is designed. The second one is a shift in the employee-employer relationship. There's a fundamental shift at play at the moment. And the third one is for organizations about building what we call adaptive capacity. How can you, as an organization, continuously learn and adapt and change as you, as you evolve? 
So, lots has been said, and this is just to reinforce the point, the shift from human to machine hours is accelerating. And you see just the shift from 2020 to 2025, it's already a significant shift. This is uh, research that has been published by the World Economic Forum together with Mercer globally, and a lot has been said, so I don't need to labor that point, it's just reinforcing this is, this is accelerating. Having said that, initially there was a lot of angst connected to that, to that notion of human hours versus machine hours. But actually, that shift has created more jobs than it has eliminated. So there is, the, the projection is that there are 79 million jobs generated by uh, leveraging more technology in the workforce and only 85 million jobs, uh, not eliminated, but a, a decrease in demand. So we see that a lot of Australian firms are already feeling the pinch. They cannot find the talent they need to deliver on their services. Yeah? So this is real. And we'll talk a little bit more. There's another shift that contributes to that, to that change as well. Um, most of you, you might remember in 2015, when two Oxford academics, um, Fry and Osborne, published a paper. Uh, it was first a conference paper and then later became a peer-reviewed journal paper, which was a much, much more <laughs> moderate. But in that conference paper, they basically said 45% of jobs can be basically eliminated through automation. And that created the future of work industry yeah? Suddenly we had all these gurus talking about the future of work and automation and, and everything that happens. Subsequent research has been much more nuanced. So we now know that it's probably about 10% of actual jobs will disappear. The majority of impact on work is actually an augmentation, a change of existing jobs. Those jobs will not disappear, they will evolve. They will change in what is required in those jobs. And what some of the key shifts in what is required in those jobs is tra the transactional parts that are actually energy draining, they will decrease significantly. So AI and technology deployed well should actually contribute to good work design because what is significantly increasing in the work is the relational elements. What pe how people relate to each other, but also how they design and deliver experiences. If you're a university professor, you are designing learning experiences and you're delivering those learning experiences. If, you're, uh, if, you're in if you work with customers, you do that. If you're in, in superannuation, I, I know a couple of people are in investments, you are designing member experiences and um, investment performance, etc. So it's that piece is significantly increasing. But also, the, the shape of expertise in organization is changing as well. I'm, I'm talking about that in a minute. Together with that is a, is a trend of, around much greater fluidity. Organizations are much more choiceful about whether a skill or a capability should be employed on their payroll, or whether they should better manage that capability through a smart, way of engaging um, through partnerships, strategic partnerships, and other forms of relationships. By the way, that's, I'm at the tail end of my PhD looking at superannuation ecosystems exactly through the lens of how super funds manage capability across fluid organizational boundaries. You know, some super funds with 50 people on their payroll managing an ecosystem of 1,200 people to deliver their member and, and uh, investment uh, performance. Now that's the shift in the work. But what I'd love to hear from you now is when you think about your own job, I don't know what you are, you might be a, uh, an academic, uh, uh, you might be an investment professional, you might be a board member. Thinking about the work that you do, I'd be interested to hear from you. What do you think, to what degree will technology and AI, and AI change your job in the coming years. And again, you've got a QR code here,
or you could go to menti.com with the code 64016076. I'd love to get your feedback on that. So it'll get you to a landing page with a couple of activities and you can then choose whether you think that activity will to a small or a significantly significant degree be impacted by AI and technology. So I'm, I've just shifted to my, yep, to my browser. I can see the first votes are coming through. see it? Okay. Seeing some very interesting results coming through here. So, a lot of you believe that obviously admin task will be significantly um, disrupted through AI. What, what I find interesting is that some of you also think that even like people management related work um, could be, could be uh, changed. What, what we see with client and stakeholder interactions and engagement, that's where definitely not a bad call if it's, I don't know what statisticians would call this shape, but you know, there's, there is not a, a, a unified view of how much that could be disrupted. Um, and then report writing and research papers. <laughs> um, I'm sitting on 150 plus hours of recorded interviews with executives. And I'm still secretly hoping that AI is catching up with that and doing all the work because, as you know, transcribing is incredibly painful um, and thematic analysis. So I'm still hoping there will be some algorithm doing all the work for me and I just need to push the publishing button. So it's, 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 it is really interesting. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to another vote later. But just um, talking about, talking about to what degree this is shifting, there is the other shift that we would say um, linked to the, I think Nate, you call it task, going into task. And the other way of looking at task is actually looking at the smallest unit of analysis is skill. And a lot of organizations are deconstructing jobs through a lens of skills. And there's a whole, there's whole, a whole skills economy. It is the number one agenda for um, executives to really understand what are the skills that really drive their strategy and growth. But only 14% of companies at the moment have completely skill-based talent strategies. So there's a massive gap between aspiration and reality. That's probably important. And Nick, interesting for you to hear from an enterprise learning perspective. Also, um, skills are also, they're, they're not only the new currency organizations have invested significantly. In Australia, the increase in skills investment was from pre-pandemic 1,200 per employee to, sorry, 1,200 to 3,400, 3, slightly back now. But a lot of organizations have significantly invest, invested in workplace learning, enterprise learning over the last couple of years. And that's, I see a lot of universities tapping into that money as well, big RFPs and huge amount of work in the public sector in that space. What we also see is that shift from what used to be the T-shaped skill, where you have one specific area of expertise, um, that more and more organizations reinforce the notion of an M-shaped professional, where you have multiple areas of expertise. And you, you might see that in your degrees, you study law and technology, you study law and psychology, you study <coughs> Law and arts, there are people who do creative intelligence in law, like very 
different domains to bring them together and that makes a much more rounded professional. But it also creates a very different expectation for individuals what that means for a career. If you're an M-shaped professional, you want to have different career experiences and learning experiences in an organization, yeah? So a traditional siloed way of working will not cut it. You need to have very different approaches to how you do that. And that leads us to the next point, which is around the employee and employer relationship and how that is shifting. There is a fundamental shift at play at the moment. And I would call the headline that you see here, employees don't want to work for you if you're an employer, they want to work with you. That is a fundamental shift in the way people engage with organizations and individuals engage with organizations. 51% told us they consider the future of work to be more balanced, that work will be redesigned to allow time for family, hobbies, work, health, and learning. And that is real. That is very loud and clear. We come to that in a little bit more detail. You know, we are in the experience economy and what used to be the customer experience uh, paradigm has been terrific. You know, we learned about empathetic product design, design thinking, that became mainstream. We've done customer journeys and personas and we've been really, really good with making everything look and feel much more human-centered. Um, and we've applied that paradigm and thinking into the employee experience and made helped to remove barriers, to make it seamless, um, to help employees to really um, work in an almost like in a consumer grade uh, environment at work. That's fantastic. But what came through the pandemic very loud and clear is that people had time and space away from the office to really reevaluate their lives. And what they realized is you could, you could have the most seamless employee experiences, the best platforms, the best technology. It can still be a very transactional experience as an employee. And what people are looking for is they're looking for the energy. What gives me energy? What are those sources of joy? And individuals are much more reflective of that. Um, it is a real conundrum. I mean, imagine the legal profession or professional services. It's based on billable hours. It's based on, you know, productivity. How much work can someone churn at a given time? And how does that relate to that challenge around energy and uh, sources of joy and, and helping individuals to tackle that? 74% um, of employees who ring their work energy level at 10, which is the highest level in our survey, they also state that their work-life balance is great. There's a direct connection between that. Um, so we could spend a whole day just going into the piece around energy and how energy is almost like the new currency trade, uh, traded against time. Now, this leads us to that, that shift. What people want from work has not changed, but the way they want to engage with that work is fundamentally shifting. It's, it all, it started with a loyalty contract and it's a perfect example is my father-in-law. He's a, he started his career at 18 at, as a Pontus cadet, becoming a pilot. And he retired on the dot on the day at his, on his 60th birthday, birthday, big retirement party. He retired and he finished. He had one employer in his life. His two kids, both in their 40s, both of them had more than 40 employers. In a, one of them is a lawyer, by the way. Um, and it's like from, from one job in a lifetime to 40 plus jobs in 40 years, uh, 40 years of age. So it's on different contents. Do you see how much that has shifted in a very short period of time? So the loyalty contract has then been replaced by what we call the engagement contract, the human relations movement, psychology moved into the workspace. It was all about how can we unlock motivation and, 
and leverage psychology to squeeze more out of people, to make them more productive, more engaged, and ideally, you know, help the top and bottom line. Then came the Thrive contract, some fascinating research, by the way, coming out of Queensland and Germany, Holland, and, and California around thriving at work. If this is a topic of interest for you, just Google Scholar thriving at work. There's some fascinating research. And one of the key things is the differentiation between engagement and thriving is you can be highly engaged in the work, but it's a, a stagnating experience because you're no longer growing. So thriving is engagement and growth combined. Um, and now what we see now is that emerging contract, which is all about energy. You can be highly engaged, you can be growing, but if you are, if, if you don't feel like you've got the energy to sustain what you do, it's not cutting it. And more and more organizations are looking through that lens of energy and whole of life perspective, which we, we call the life X contract, that organizations need to be aware of. Now, Another word. I'd love to hear from you, either for you as an individual, if you run your own company, or an obs a curious observer, which of those contracts do you think is most relevant or prevalent for you? Or if you're an organization, I'd love to hear, what do you think, which of those employment contracts are most relevant for your people at the moment? Is it loyalty? There's still a lot of people who are in that loyalty contract paradigm. Is it engagement? Is it thriving that's, you know, um, it's that growth focus and learning and self-transcending, or is it about uh, the life X contract? So we'll go back to um, the menti vote, and what do you see then, would love to see your ranking, just to see what do you think is the predominant contract? And I'll give you a minute just to answer that. So there's a ranking, so you can, you can also choose one, two, three, four. Engagement contract seems to be top of the list. So that sense of affiliation, that sense of connection um, with other people, and then followed by Thrive, that need for growth. Uh, and it seems like that lifestyle contract is, maybe it's, it's the, uh, maybe it's the, the uh, for you here specifically, uh, or more broadly also what you think in your organization, what you're hearing from your people at the moment. And loyalty contract is lowest on the list. That, that might look different if, we had that with a military organization or with an airline or with a more traditional um, organization <coughs> setup. Thank you for sharing that. Just summarizing that for you as organizations, it's thinking about your organization as an energy grid. We have got a global energy crisis, a massive crisis in Europe around energy, but I think there is also an energy crisis in many organizations. So think about your organization as an energy grid. How can you tackle energy diminishes and how can you help amplify energy where possible? And yes, that's something that you can do it at an individual level, but you also need to think about what does that mean for teams, for leaders, for strategy and governance? What are some of the inhibitors? What are some of the amplifiers there? And that leads us to the topic around adaptive capacity. How can you, at an organizational level, 
build much greater adaptive capacity. Now, looking at the picture, traditional organizations, much more top-down, uh, hierarchy-focused uh, and organized. You see on the left side, the typical pyramid, organized around spans of control and hierarchies. And you see on the right side, organizations much more organized around um, flow of work, you know, where reporting lines are far less important and actually how teams build around end-to-end -end accountability is far more important. You see leaders don't sit on top of the pyramid, they sit behind, they sit in the center of the circle because their job is actually just to remove the barriers for people around them and help them to really thrive and, and get work done. Uh, it's a fascinating piece of work that Novartis has done last year globally around unbossing, unbossing the organization, which I find is a fantastic initiative um, because a lot of that hierarchical thinking is not helpful. And it's fascinating to see those sectors who have been hit hardest by the exodus of talent are quite often quite hierarchically organized sectors. Look at the health sector. Some universities, Bond, obviously very different, but you know, traditionally universities are quite hierarchical and, and procedure oriented. And so where you see a, a mass exodus of talent, often in those more traditional public education, very typical examples where a lot of people have left. Thinking about, at an individual level, adaptability is so important because more and more people actually don't want to retire at the age of 60. And in fact, in Australia, there's almost the notion of retiring retirement. 84% of Australians told us that they want to work beyond retirement age. It's one of the highest percentages in the world. In Europe, there's some misincentives, like some people actually would like to work longer, but tax incentives are working against them. But in Australia, 84% of people want to work beyond retirement age. Um, so how do you keep work interesting and relevant? How do you maintain that energy and growth and vitality over a 60-year career or a 100-year life? So those are really important questions that a lot of organizations are trying to answer. So we asked them, how do you see yourself on the adaptability journey. The majority of them are learners, but 27% of them told us that they are, they would self-identify and enlightened. And what enlightened organizations do is they really encourage them to disrupt themselves all the time and also help leaders and individuals to save, to fail safe and fail fast. So that is a really uh, important feature for that. And what does that mean to disrupt yourself? It's, it means basically to question what you do all the time. Deconstruct the job. Why are you doing what you're doing? Who is benefiting from that? Who would actually recognize <laughs> if you stop doing what you're doing? Um, who is doing it? And is that actually the right place for that to be done? How well is technology leveraged in what you do? How could that be done differently? Thinking about that through the lens of disruption, I, I thought I'd just share my own job as an example. If I look at my job as a partner of a professional services firm, I do a lot of workforce and organizational transformation. I spend a lot of time with benchmarking, mapping jobs to our database, understanding how organizations compare. I think there's a lot of opportunity for AI to do that even better. We already use AI in that process, but just learning from today how much more that could be done, uh, I think there's a huge opportunity to improve that. I spend a huge amount of time in board meetings, in stakeholder interviews. If I had technology that captures all of that information, transcribes it, thematic analysis, doing all of that for me, I, hopefully I could spend much more time on the beach or doing, doing other things, have more billable hours, um, etc. I've just done a little back of an envelope analysis of my job, I think I could easily squeeze out 24% of that just through better leverage of technology. Now the question is, should that be the basis of a renegotiation of, renegotiation of my salary? Or my employer would say, fantastic, productivity 
a profitability improvement, or should that be my business case for the four-day work week? I don't know. It could be all of those. And I think a lot of organizations will do a lot of soul-searching in how technology can be used to actually create greater human centricity in the workplace. That's definitely my business case that I would put forward. Yeah. Um, so, organizations and individuals, you need to think about where do you invest? What do you, where do you need to re recalibrate? What could you do, do differently? Where do you need to build capability and capacity moving forward? So, that brings me to the final point. This session was not about giving you answers. This session was much more about a few thought-provoking ideas. Um, a lot of the, the future of work is in your hands. It's about your choices that you make. What does that mean for your job, for your team, for your organization? Do you want to create more human centricity? Do you want to provide greater energy? Um, what is your people narrative? How do you shape that strategy and narrative in your organization? And then to what degree do you allow yourself and your team to experiment, to explore, to adapt, to fail, and move forward very quickly? So thanks, thanks very much.